Hello everyone, today we'll be talking about peptic ulcer disease. I'm making this video because about three people requested that I discuss about peptic ulcer disease. So peptic ulcer disease, just as the name sounds, is when there is discontinuation in the inner lining of the gastrointestinal tract because of secretion of gastric acid or pepsin. Now, the gastrointestinal tract is the tract, we call it in short form, GIT, is the tract where the food enters through and is digested, absorbed, and the excreta passed through the anus. So that's the gastrointestinal tract. It starts from the mouth. When you swallow food, it enters your esophagus. Look at the picture above. From your esophagus, it enters your stomach. From your stomach, it enters the small intestine, and from small intestine, it enters the large intestine, and then to the rectum, and it passes through the anus as feces. Now that that is the gastrointestinal tract. When you hear of ulcer, anyway, you hear of ulcer, it means there is a wound. A wound means ulcer. So when we say peptic ulcer disease, we mean that there is a discontinuation. There is a wound. In the gastrointestinal tract and this occurs due to secretion of gastric acid or pepsin these are secreted in the gastrointestinal tract mostly the stomach so they secrete this tract and they secrete this acid or pepsin and this may lead to a peptic ulcer disease peptic ulcer disease or let me just say ulcer occurs in the stomach see the stomach in the stomach and or the duodenum the proximal duodenum that's the next part following the stomach so it can occur in the stomach or the duodenum now when somebody has um peptic ulcer disease this injury occurs in the person's stomach then it can also occur in the lower esophagus just below before the stomach before you arrive at the stomach but the esophagus where you swallow can occur on the lower part of it or it can occur on the distal duodenum. So these are the places that peptic ulcer diseases occur. If you are new to my channel, my name is Dr. Nkiruka Bridget. I'm a consultant obstetrician gynecologist. I discuss everything about women's health, children's health, and sometimes men's health on my page. Subscribe to my YouTube page at Dr. Nkiruka Bridget at OBJYN Talk to Dr. Adazayon. Follow me on Facebook at Obidwine Talks with Dr. Adazayan. I'm on TikTok and on Instagram with the same name. So let's continue. Hit the notification button now. Let's go. Ulcer disease has two types. We we'll have the gastric ulcer or the duodenal ulcer. Gastric is mostly the stomach. So stomach ulcer literally or the duodenal ulcer. Duodenum is part of the small intestine. So... How do you know? Both of them are peptic ulcer diseases, either gastric ulcer or duodenal ulcer. Now, how do you know that you have which? Which of, as if you have peptic ulcer, which one do you have? The commonest symptom of peptic ulcer disease is epigastric pain. Pain just immediately below the chest, just at the beginning of the stomach. That's epigastric. So when you have epigastric pain, it shows likely that you have peptic ulcer. So most people with peptic ulcer disease come with epigastric pain. And for someone that has that pain just immediately after eating, about 10 to 15 minutes after eating, that person likely has gastric ulcer. That is her own, his or her own ulcer is in the stomach. But someone that has her pain, Two to three hours, maybe when she has, he or she has even forgotten that she has eaten, likely has duodena or So what are the causes of peptic ulcer diseases? The causes can be divided into commonest causes and rare causes. The things that commonly cause peptic ulcer diseases, in fact, the number one there is Helicobacter pylori infection. It's a bacteria that is acquired mostly during childhood. We are going to talk about it in a, in a jiffy. Now, the second cause of the second commonest cause of peptic ulcer disease is NSAID, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We'll talk about that drug because it's one of the commonly abused drugs. Then the third is other medications like corticosteroid and all those stuff. So we'll talk about that. Now, 
Let's go to Helicobacter pylori infection. So, Helicobacter pylori infection is a bacterial organism. It's responsible for 90% of duodenal ulcers and about 70 to 90% of gastric ulcer. Is a bacteria that is common and is acquired mostly during childhood. And you find it mostly in low socioeconomic class individuals. So when someone has Helicobacter pylori infection causing his or her ulcer, he or she might have acquired that during childhood and may not even know, except that he or she has peptic ulcer. So that Helicobacter, Helicobacter pylori is a bacteria. It has, it has, it has some things that made it um, how that you very length the, the ability to stay in the stomach remember the stomach secretes gastric acid and what you wonder why does the gastric acid of the stomach not kill this uh, bacteria because it has some things that it has acquired and modified itself to make it stay in the stomach without being destroyed by the gastric acid it has urease an enzyme called urease it produces ammonia from ammonia from urea and this helps to protect the organism from the gastric acid so no matter what you do you cannot say that the gastric acid you produce will kill it it will not it will just be there causing more problem then it has some toxins it's to the toxin it produces when it's in the stomach cause inflammation around the linings of the stomach making it more for the ulcer to increase so that's why when you have Helicobacter pylori infection, you have to be treated. And that's why most people, if you leave them with ulcer, it will continue to increase. Next, you'll be hearing about complications like perforations. Anyway, we'll come to that. Then, it has flagella. Flagella is like um, something that helps it to move. So that when you swallow it, it moves straight. It's moving straight. Even when you don't want it to move, it's moving on its own. And it will find its way to the stomach and will not stay there. So it has flagella that helps it in its motility and to get to the stomach. However, it can be treated. Remember, it's a bacterial infection. Now let's talk about NSAID. NSAID, N-S-A-I-D-S, is a short form for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. It's one of the commonest analgesics. People take it for pains. People take it for fever. And it works magic. Some of these um, drugs include diclofenac, uh, ibuprofen, you know, when people abuse this drug because mostly in the tropics or uh, tropical country or third world country, you see it over the cancer. Anybody goes, buys it, sells, you can even see people selling it in the market. However, chronically taking this drug can cause what we call gastritis. Gastritis with inflammation of the stomach and from inflammation, it will peel and become an ulcer. So constantly taking NSAID can give you peptic ulcer diseases because it works by eating the production of prostaglandin so that prostaglandin actually works to protect the stomach so when you take NSAID that is diclofenac, ibuprofen, all those things that will inhibit that protection offered by prostaglandin by preventing the pro production of that prostaglandin that protect the stomach and the person will have gastritis so we have other medications like uh, corticosteroid fluorouracin potassium chloride chronic use of these drugs can also give you peptic ulcer diseases so if you are on these things that i've mentioned or you have been told you have these things this may be the cause of your peptic ulcer diseases we have other rare causes like um, zollinger ellison syndrome we have stress. Do you know that stress can give you peptic ulcer disease? So most times, stress alters a lot of things in the body. So stress can give you peptic ulcer disease. We have other things like um, um, malignancy. When there's cancer of the stomach, it may give you peptic ulcer disease. We have other things like Crohn's disease. These ones are rare. However, this can be your cause of peptic ulcer disease. The ones I mentioned, the first three, are the commonest cause in about 90% of people or more that have peptic ulcer diseases. So what are the risk factors to peptic ulcer disease? Risk factors to peptic ulcer diseases include um, infection with Helicobacter pylori, just like we said. If you have already infected, if you have already been infected with Helicobacter pylori infection, 
you, you are at risk of having peptic ulcer disease. Then we have use of chronic use of NSAID, non steroid anti inflammatory drugs, this diclofenac, ibuprofen, and the sisters. Then someone that has has a family history if you have a family history of peptic ulcer disease you are also at risk that you may develop risk factor means that you don't have it but you can it can happen in you so you have a risk factor of having peptic ulcer disease immigrant from developed countries you know they may in developed country remember we said that helicobacter pylori is seen in low socioeconomic class and most people in developed country are in the upper socioeconomic class so if you are immigrating from that coming to a low socioeconomic country you may have be predisposed to the Causes of this um, peptic ulcer disease, so you are at risk. So, far you are a, a black or Hispanic, you are at risk of peptic ulcer disease. The signs and symptoms of peptic ulcer disease are as follows. Commonest is pain. When someone comes with epigastric pain, either immediately after eating or some minutes, some hours, when you have even forgotten that you have eaten. So, you may have peptic ulcer disease. Most, of, most people even present with pain. Even before meal, especially when they are severely hungry. So, these are signs, symptoms of peptic ulcer disease. Progressive dysphagia. The person may now have it, find it difficult in swallowing or pain after he have eaten. Now, unintentional weight loss. You see the person, you are losing weight unintentionally. Maybe, you know, these are symptoms of it. You have been doing everything possible not to lose weight, but you are, intentional, you are unintentionally, you are losing weight. Others could be upper gastrointestinal bleeding person stays and some small thing he's vomiting blood when someone starts vomiting blood we are thinking of first thing is peptic ulcer disease that is the place is eroding and so it has eroded into a blood vessel and the, the, the vessel is bleeding and so she may start vomiting blood the person the person with peptic ulcer disease may be passing black stew black stew means that she bled into her stomach and you know now the body cannot vomit it especially for the ordinary ulcer the body will have to pass it through this too so when it has passed through the gastrointestinal tract before it can reach the rectum the enzymes has worked on it and it has changed color it becomes black too so someone with peptic ulcer disease when you start passing black too or start vomiting blood is actually a very um their emergency you should report to the hospital then someone with peptic ulcer disease can come with abdominal pain when it has perforated the person will have abdominal pains because even feces may be passing to the stomach to the abdomen just the peritoneum call it peritoneum and it will now start irritating other parts of the gut of the gastrointestinal tract and the person will have severe abdominal pains acute abdomen that will be screaming will not be able to walk as even in children self so these are uh, complications the person may even come with anemia especially iron deficiency anemia Remember that she may be bleeding, or he or she may be bleeding. And as you are losing blood, you are losing, you may still require blood. So the person will come with, and they may look at the person, the person is pale, the person will require blood transfusion. These are some of the signs and symptoms of uh, peptic ulcer disease. And what is the treatment? Treatment of peptic ulcer disease now depends on its, co its cause. Initially, when the person comes with pain, you can do things to alleviate the pain, reduce the pain, but definitive treatment. You can treat the symptom what the person came with. If the person came with epigastric pain, you can try as much as possible to re reduce the pain. You can even give some uh, antacids to douse the pain. The person will also may be given some drugs we call omeprazole just to douse the place and reduce the uh, production of the gastric acid. Now, the person may be given blood if he has uh, uh, anemia. If he's vomiting blood and passing blood, you may have to replenish the blood. If the person you want to treat the person definitively, there's a definitive treatment for peptic ulcer disease. If it's infection, we have to treat that Helicobacter pylori infection with not just the use of antibiotics. We use antibiotics, we use proton pump inhibitor, we use H2 antagonist. If you go to the hospital, the doctors know these drugs and they will know what to do. Some we can just use one drug, some we can use combination of drugs, some we can use add antibiotics to it, depending on the cause of that peptic ulcer disease. Now, if the person is the peptic ulcer disease is from drugs, you stopped that drug. You encourage the person to stop taking. 
um, NSAID, non steroid anti inflammatory drug, whatever the drug that is causing that particular disease is, we stop it. But before we go into treatment, you know, we have to analyze the person, we'll do some investigations. The, we have H. pylori tests. We can do an investigation to find out that if the organism is there. And we cannot do other, uh, other preliminary investigations to find out are you passing stool? Do you have any other disease, any other thing that can cause you to have those symptoms that is not just peptic ulcer disease? So treatment depends on the cause. However, peptic ulcer disease can be managed. It's not something that you go traditional. It's not something we we'll, we'll modify your lifestyle and will place you on drug. And if it's Helicobacter pylori. We can even give you there's a combination of two antibiotics with other drugs. There are a lot of drugs we use. Sometimes we use omeprazole, sometimes we use antibiotics just for the uh, for the helicobacter pylori. We stop the medication that is causing the disease. Then we can even sometimes we give the person even antacids, some antacids to douse the place and douse the pain. Then if there's other complications that has arose from it, we treat those complications. If you're anemic, we transfuse you. Now, if you have already perforated, there's perforation. We we'll have to take you to surgery. So there's a place for surgery in peptic ulcer. For someone that has perforated, you heard the doctor say, we're going to take you to surgery. When we take you, we'll close those perforations and we'll ask you we'll to do the treatment and ask you on how to live your lifestyle modification. If there is, peptic ulcer has a good prognosis, except when you have allowed it to perforate so much that the person's life is, is, is on a scale. That's when the prognosis is poor, but generally, prognosis is good. Complications that ar arise from it is treated, and the patient goes on to live his or her life. Thank you for watching to this point. My name is Dr. Nkiruka Bridget, known as Dr. Adazayo. I discuss everything about women's health, children's health, and sometimes men's health on my channel. Subscribe to my YouTube page at Dr. Nkiruka Bridget at OBJY Tells with Dr. Adazayo. Follow me on Facebook page at OBGYN Talks with Dr. Adazayo. I'm also on TikTok and on Instagram with the same name. See you next time for another enriching, beautiful video. Thank you. Share this video, please. Share it now. Let's grow this page. Grow this channel. Do that for me. Thank you. <laughs>